All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's do our 6-2 uh, Moss uh, watch comparison. Now, before I go on, I just want to let you guys know, I had to write a book about watch addiction. I wrote a book about watch addiction about three years ago, and uh, watch addiction rules. And then I was going to write a second one, a nonfiction book, but as it turns out, it became fiction. It became a retelling of The Wizard of Oz. I envisioned this band of misfit toys, watch addicts. I call them heroglodites. They, uh, they go to a watch meetup at the Sheridan Resort in Kauai where there is the Wizard of Watches who can cure you of your watch addiction. Or can he? <laughs> or is he a fraud? Well, you'll have to read the book to find out. So I wrote the book, finished it, proofread it. And uh, so what I got to do is now I have to um, write a, a, a cover letter, a synopsis to some uh, literary agents. And they may find it too specialized. I mean, they may look at the watch addiction market and go, look, you know, there are your watch addicts who are on YouTube and there's probably... A lot of you, there, there's a, probably a few hundred thousand of you, and that could be a good sale, but on the other hand, it might be too specialized of an audience, and I don't want to handle that. And, and if that's the case, then, then I'll have to self-publish it, and it'll have to be an ebook, a Kindle situation. And if I sell it myself, it'll probably be like $3.99 a copy, and I'll have to do a link. Either way, whether I self-publish it or, or uh, get a literary agent, I think I'm going to have to go on some YouTube channels, do some interviews to promote it, or at the very least have some YouTubers who do watch channels uh, at least give a link to the book. Uh, so the book does capture the insanity. So I, I wanted to do a comparison of these two uh, Seikos because I think in my uh, 17 years of collecting, these have been pretty pretty disruptive probably the most disruptive. Uh, this is the SPB 143 that many of you are uh, familiar with. This is the newer uh, release, the uh, the Arctic Blue uh, SBDC 165, which uh, you can see all by itself there. And uh, I'm trying to figure out why these watches kind of took over uh, my collection. And when I say they took over, I mean, there are other versions that I'm also attracted to. Uh, oh man, if you go to Random Rob's channel, he does a review of the uh, SPB 147, which is a gilt gold. In my wildest dreams, you know, I never would have thought I would have liked gilt or gold, but I don't know the way they did it on uh, that SPB 147. I c can you imagine getting another one? It, it might be too much. It might be too much of an overload. So, what I like about these is that. There's this vintage vibe. I mean, they, they do reinterpret uh, 1960 uh, models. And uh, there are more expensive versions of this, slightly smaller, 39 millimeters SLA versions that cost like 4,500 bucks. But at under 1,000, these are really, uh, these are quite a good uh, fit for, for most uh, watch collectors. Pretty good fit. And uh, the other thing is the comfort. I mean, I, I used to think that the Captain Willard, and I have two versions of the Willard. I have the uh, the 6R35 uh, black, but then I even have the more expensive one called the Yamura, which uh, I had to have a, a Rob at the Random Rob channel send back to me because I, I missed it too much, and I'm wearing it right now as we speak. He's wearing it! And so uh, the comfort of these... Um, these smaller models, these 40.5 SPBs, is just it's it's even better than the Willards, and uh, and I what can you say? I mean, you know, you you get smaller watches, and they're going to probably be more comfortable, generally speaking, uh, than bigger watches, and they've really acclimated my my sense of scale and size. I don't need a large and in charge watch. I mean the. The Yamura is big enough. The Yamura is just big enough. You can see how much larger the Yamura is at 44. I mean, that's about as large in charge as I need to go. 
and the Amura is very comfortable, much more comfortable than the MM300. I, I couldn't bond with the MM300, I think because of the bulk, and I know a lot of you have told me, oh my god, I've had the MM300 uh, uh, six times, <laughs> and I kept rebuying. I'm not going to, I'm done. I'm done with the MM300, and I'm done with the Tuna. Regarding the Tuna, it's quartz. I could never bond with quartz. I get anxieties when I wear quartz watches. I, I always, why am I wearing quartz? I could be wearing a mechanical. So it's insane. I mean, quartz is, for many reasons is more practical, more accurate, less problematic, but ugh, <laughs> I'm not, I, this is not a rational enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a rational enterprise. So, uh, this is a, I mean, you, you could just have these two watches all by themselves. You've got your uh, warm uh, Umura, and then you've got your cool tone right there. You're done. Or if you just wanted to spend even less, this is this two watch collection right here. You're done. you got your warm bronze gray 143, and you've got your uh, SBDC 165. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's it. Uh, the Secret Life of Watch Addicts is done. i got to figure out uh, what publication route it's going to be. And until next time, I'm out.